The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. We are here today in the matter of, I don't know if it's pronounced Nahas or Nahas. Thank you. Nahas versus Polk County, Iowa and others. Um, it looks like both parties are ready. Ms. Gavin, would you like to begin? Chief Justice, counsel, and may it please the court. My name is Megan Gavin. I'm here today on behalf of Polk County and the name Polk County officials. This matter stems from a 2020 employment decision made on behalf of Polk County Administrator John Norris. Jim Nahas was the former HR director for Polk County who was terminated after he lost the confidence of his new boss, Mr. Norris, following an internal investigation. This is not a unique case. This is an employment decision of an at-will employee. These types of decisions are made every day in every county throughout this state. What once used to be an exception to the at-will employment doctrine Wrongful termination, we believe, has now expanded to become the rule and not the exception. In this case, which should be a very routine employment matter, we have a seven count petition, over 220 paragraph allegations. We believe when this court undertakes its review, we would ask that you take what used to be the exceptional torts of wrongful termination, intentional infliction of emotional distress, extortion, and you can find them back to this court's original intent when those torts were recognized. To show you how the doctrine of wrongful termination has gone from this exception to the at-will employment doctrine to this nebulous, ill-defined doctrine, you have to look no further than the second amended petition itself. In chapter one, in paragraph 169, the plaintiff sets forth six different protected activities that he suggests were violative of public policy prohibiting his termination. He then later goes on to suggest that those six different activities both individually and collectively, could, he could mount a wrongful termination action from those six. The way that I interpret the six, to me they can be broken down into two different categories. Some of the allegations deal with routine matters that would be before a human resources director of a large organization. His office would have be the receptacle of internal complaints, whether that be for employee wrongdoing, hostile work environment, et cetera. Several of his stated protected activities are purely his job duties as HR director. Well, I, I sort of view this case through the lens of the qualified immunity defense and then the motion to dismiss under 1.421. And uh, under 1.421, we've said before many times that that's a really high bar to get over at this stage, that you know, summary judgment might be appropriate later, but uh, for us to dismiss claims at this stage in state court is pretty rare. And so what is, what is so special about this case, why we should do it here? If, if, if we were to do it under 1.421. Thank you, Your Honor. To answer that particular question, I think your case law supports both dealing with this legal question at both the motion to dismiss stage and summary judgment. There are wrongful termination cases that are handled on both. And I think in this case, it's because there's purely no precedential value for extending the tort. This is not a case where it's based upon an allegation that Mr. Nahas was terminated after filing a workers' comp claim 
or even a deviation, a small minor deviation from your prior case law where you've recognized internal complaints of whistleblowing to be a protected activity. And then in Dorshine, she didn't technically make an internal complaint, certainly not a written complaint, but made an oral complaint. So that would be a, a minor addition to um, your prior case law. Here we are whole cloth inventing a new tort. But to go to your point on the two different prongs for the motion to dismiss and why we believe we win on either if you go a 670 issue or you do the traditional rules of civil procedure. But to your point, there is a substantive procedural difference. And because of judicial economy, this court's longstanding precedent that motions to dismiss are disfavored, to get a thorough material review at this stage by the district court is difficult. We believe the legislature mandated that for government under the auspices of the 670 qualified immunity. Why the conduct that occurred before that law went on the books? As your honor, I think there are different, different avenues that this court can take. I think, um, as you discussed during the Polly Carver Kim arguments last month, there are certain pleading requirements that the statute set forth in subsection three. Some of those pertain to the application of qualified immunity. Some of those pertain to the factual and legal arguments themselves, irrespective of qualified immunity. So we would submit, Your Honor, that those pleading requirements absolutely apply in this case and to any case that's filed after the effective date of the statute. I would also submit, Your Honor, that yes, the actual immunity potentially applies to claims that were not vested pre the enactment of the statute. And I don't believe that violates this court's precedent in the Thorn case. Before the, the enactment of the statute? Misconduct, the alleged misconduct in this case occurred before the enactment of the statute. That's not in dispute. When I talk about the vesting of his claims, I believe that goes to whether his claims were recognized and existed on the day of, of the allegation. Like the 670, you're right. There's the qualified immunity portion, and there's the height and pleading portion. Let's assume, the, for discussion purposes, the height and pleading has been satisfied. Let's talk about the qualified immunity. Can you help me understand, um, based on what uh, where Justice Waterman was just going, if the conduct occurred before the new statute, um, and if we said immunity applied, is there anywhere for, defend, for a plaintiff to go in that action for recourse? I think so, Your Honor, and I think that it goes, well, I would like this court to apply that statute globally to all the counts. Realistically, I think that is on a count-by-count -count basis that you have to determine whether or not the claim that was brought was the type of claim that was recognized in Iowa as of the date of the conduct. Let's assume that, Let's assume that, 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 that has been um, satisfied the pleading requirements, but the qualified immunity portion is what I'm getting at. I, I thought you were going back to the pleading part. No, it, it pertains to both, Your Honor, because I think it goes to whether or not the claim was vested. Did the plaintiff have a constitutional interest in that claim pre the enactment of the statute? And I think that goes to how each claim, how it resounded in law at the time of the alleged misconduct. For instance, when it comes to the defamation claim, there was case law pre the publication or the release of the termination letter that said grounds in a written termination letter for public employees could bring a defamation case. Now those predated the changes to chapter 22, but those did exist on the date that his termination letter was released. In contrast, while he's bringing other claims such as wrongful termination where the tort has obviously been recognized, the tort has never been recognized for the protected activities that he alleges, and still to this day has not been recognized. So it would be our position that you, this court would need to look on a count-by-count -count basis to determine if that claim vested to Mr. Nahas. Let's just say that, that the pleading, that there, that has all been satisfied um, regarding establishment of law that they knew. Then the qualified immunity, would it reach back to the conduct? If so, for, for claims that had vested on the date of the conduct. I think then this court's prior issues in Thorpe um, and the constitutional concerns would have more application. 
for me. So you think the clearly established pleading requirement applies, but the qualified immunity substantively itself would not. Is that what you're saying? No, I believe that it could. For this universe of cases that are filed after the effective date of the statute, but the conduct predates the statute, I think to avoid constitutional due process concerns, you would have to look at each individual count to determine whether or not that claim vested on that day. Whether it's vested. So you've talked about the defamation claim. Let's talk about the chapter 21 or 22 claim. Chapter 22 claim would not have vested. There is no precedent in Iowa law for a uh, for Chapter two, 22 claim where the alleged conduct was the release of records. Vesting with clearly established. I think in that way it seems like a circular argument in the sense of that's when you apply the qualified immunity, but I actually do believe the standards for when a claim vests are very similar in this conduct. I mean, because I was thinking the same thing before you said that, that the statute requiring the claim to be clearly established applies where the claim is clearly established. That's what you're saying. Retroactively, if we make a retroactive determination that the law was clear, then we apply the statute. I think they are very similar concepts, again, for this narrow class of cases. Eventually, this court's not going to be dealing with cases where the conduct predated the enactment of the statute, and then there won't be a constitutional concern. But these are kind of unique facts that this court is dealing with, in this case, in the two prior cases you heard last month. Um, as I said, Your Honors, I think that there are grounds for granting the motion to dismiss under both 670 and the pleading requirements. But to go to counsel's claims in brief that What's your best case to support dismissal at this stage under the rules of civil procedure? Civil procedure that this claim, yes, it's a, it's a 37 page petition and there are a lot of facts and there are a lot of irrelevant facts, but there are still not the applicable facts on um, the applicable law where it is material. For instance, in the wrongful termination, global statements are made that this violates the public policy of the state of Iowa. There's no attempt there to say what the source is of that public policy. In other respects, it filed and may not state the source pursuant to code section such and such. Do you think all of them would be worthy of dismissal? I think at that point in time, if defense counsel points out the potential errors and they're not rectified um, through amendments or not argued to the court, then yes, that would be potential. I don't think it's something that the court would do sua sponte. And try and review a 37-page petition with 200-plus paragraphs at that stage of the game. Wouldn't that be quite an incredibly heavy lift for a court? Wouldn't it be easier for the court to say, keep going, people? Absolutely. And that is, of course, what happens here. Is it's a matter of judicial economy that that is the path of least resistance for the district court to take, which is why we think the application of 670 to be so important because it mandates a thorough material review by the district court at the initial pleading stage. Your argument for dismissal than the rule of civil procedure? I think it does require a more thorough review. I think that there are just some basic legal omissions in this case and theories that have never been tested under Iowa law. For example, in the intentional affliction of emotional distress, that is a claim that does get dismissed at the pleading stage quite often because of the high burden of the outrageous conduct. Same with you look at the Chapter 21 claim. There are a lot of I, I realize that on a motion to dismiss, the some things that are pled with upon information and belief are generally deemed sufficient. Um, Six seventy has several subparts. If we were to find that it doesn't apply to the substance of the claim here, we still have subsection three, which is the the pleading piece. And that sort of has two components to it. One is that the allegations have to be plausible, and then the other that it violates clearly established law. It strikes me as maybe odd that the clearly established law piece, which reverts back to the qualified immunity piece, if that's not part of this, does subsection three really apply to this case? I mean, aren't we sort of slicing and dicing uh, a pleading requirement in subsection three in a really odd way? I think that you 
potentially are. I think the savings clause mandates that this court apply as much of the statute to these particular um, claims as possible. I think that's our obligation. I would agree with you that it functionally doesn't make a lot of rational sense to plead around qualified immunity if this court determines that the qualified immunity provisions don't apply. I do, however, think the heightened pleading standards do and should apply to this case because the action of legal consequence was the drafting of the petition. And in addition to omitting the source of the public policy, there are implausible facts or implausible facts that are beyond Mr. Nahas's personal knowledge that are pled in the petition. For instance, when it comes to the open meetings violation, we address real quickly. I know it's hard because there are so many claims that you can't really touch on each, but I want to talk a little bit about the defamation claim. And I think earlier you said that there was clearly established law that you could defame somebody by posting or putting false information in a termination letter. So, but that sounds different than what you argued in the brief. So are you conceding that at least the defamation claim should proceed? I would concede that that is their strongest claim um, for moving forward after the motion to dismiss claim. But as I mentioned previously, while there was case law to that point on the defamation, that predated the changes to chapter 22 that made it a legal obligation on behalf of public employers to upon a public records request release records that stated the reasons and rationale for an employee's termination. Nice. The inclusion of false information in the termination letter. I mean, it's a duty to disclose truthful reasons. If they put in there that he was a sex abuser, it would. I mean, that would clearly be a defamation claim, right? It would, but I believe. I, I want to be careful here, Your Honor. I don't believe the duty is truthful. I believe the duty is factual. And as this court has stated, we could be incorrect about a grounds for termination as long as that termination isn't. Those grounds aren't themselves unlawful. I mean, but then that's a fact issue on whether or not there's malice, recklessness, et cetera. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me that the duty to publish or make the statements public just necessarily immunizes the government on a defamation claim. And maybe it sounds like you're agreeing. I don't know. Your point, Your Honor, I think that puts, I apologize. Um, I see my time's up, my answer. Question, you go ahead. Your Honor, I understand your point, Your Honor, but I do believe that government is in an untenable position, especially if this court recognizes a claim for the release of records under Chapter 22. The potential liability for government is exponential. If we hold liability both for the release of records and for the, for the non-release of records, I think that would provoke a prudent government attorney to seek a DAC action, especially in potentially complicated requests, which are frequent. Thank you. If there's no further questions, I'll... Good morning. May it please the court, counsel. The district court correctly denied defendant's motion to dismiss under 670.4a and rule 1.421. With respect to 670.4a, defendants are clearly seeking to improperly apply the new substantive changes retroactively to Mr. Nahas' claims, each of which unequivocally vested prior to the new law coming into effect. At the time of defendants... The light is red, if we could fix that. So I don't want you to think you have to... There you go. You... At the time of, of defendants' tortious conduct, Mr. Nahas did not need to plead and prove that his rights were clearly established, whatever that term means under this new law. At I'll challenge you a little bit on that. He was terminated on January 5th. Everything happened in 21 that I'm going to talk about. The new statute was five months later. And the very first petition wasn't even for three more months. Correct. So what if the statute says um, when you file your petition, you have to sign it with a red pen? I mean... How can this possibly not apply to your case when, when the statutes, and it has to do with the petition. They're not going back in time and, and talking about things that happened in the past. When you decide to file a petition, we're not reaching back and saying for things that have already been filed. How does that not apply to you? 
the, the red pen requirement would be purely procedural, but this new law says that you have to plead that your rights were clearly established at the time of the violation. So it does, it does reach back to, to, the, to the conduct that occurred. Whether or not the, the qualified immunity applies, but just on the procedural part of what they want in a petition, as you can tell from my word procedural, isn't that just procedural? And, and so I would, I would say this, that we complied with those procedural requirements. We, we unequivocally stated with particularity the circumstances giving rise to each of the claims. And within the petition, we set out the law, we set out the elements, and we set out how defendants violated that. And defendants had been a bit inconsistent as to whether there's a magic language that the words clearly established must be in the petition or not. At one point, I think they took the position that it did. And then when we corrected that, or just put it in there, they said, no, that's not enough. And so I, I, even within defendant's own argument. Between uh, petitions two and three, that's really more or less all you did was added that language? Added that language because at that time, it, it appeared to be defendant's position that that was all that was defective with our, with our petition under this new law to the extent that it applies to Mr. Nahas's claims. And the chapter 22 claim to me? So the chapter 22 claim is kind of two part. It goes back to the, to the defamation claim. But, but chapter 22 has this new provision now where uh, a, a, a municipal, municipality can document the reasons and rationale for terminating an employee, and that would be a public record. But what chapter 22 puts certain obligations on the municipality prior to doing that. It requires, before taking the, the disciplinary action, prior to giving written notice to the employee that if the disciplinary action is taken, it might result in information being placed in his or her personnel record that could be public. And it's undisputed, and this goes to both the defamation claim or the protection they're seeking, this public concern protection they're seeking, that the county did not do that. It made a decision that Mr. Nahas was to be fired or he was to resign in lieu of termination. Both, both decisions, both disciplinary actions would be required to be documented under Chapter 22. They did that without letting him know in writing that that was even on the table. And they did that, and the council has said John Norris made that decision. The, the pled facts of our petition are that the board did. And Mr. Nor Mr. Norris is that they didn't tell him that the reasons for his termination could be included in his personnel file. That's the violation you're claiming. And, and, and I would say too, as it goes to the, to the, the defamation claim, that defendants claim they're entitled to a heightened protection um, provide damages for that kind of violation? No, just ask for, for uh, an order, you know, to, for them not to violate that going forward. I don't think we've alleged an actual monetary damage under that count six or seven. I'm not sure which count that it is. Fees if you establish that violation under Chapter 22? I don't know, Your Honor. We have cases that the, the question whether... Uh, um, Conduct is sufficiently outrageous um, to, you know, be shocking enough to establish a, a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress. That that's a question of law for the court, which seems like appropriate for a motion to dismiss. What's your best case that that what happened here um, is sufficiently outrageous? Well, I believe that, for one. All we can do right now is state what we know in our petition. At this particular point, the defendants have not provided Mr. Nahas with any information at all regarding what went into their decision, how it was made, any of the findings that they purport to reference vaguely in his defamatory termination letter. So that said, um, at this point, without a record, without the opportunity to take depositions and what was going on, the facts are that they extorted Mr. Nahas and told him, if you don't tell us what we want to hear, we're going to fire you. And by the way, we might write a letter that makes you look bad. That's an, these are elected officials engaging in this conduct. It, it certainly exceeds all bounds of decency for elected officers to treat an employee that way. Uh, sounds like a legal conclusion to me, but is there a published decision from our court or, or courts applying a similar law that says, uh, you know, we're going to fire you if you don't do X that was found to be support that cause of action? No. 
but, but I do believe that, that the record can be developed and defendants can move for summary judgment if we don't develop a record that, that establishes that. And that happens all the time. We may, have, we may develop record here where we decide, you know what, we don't think we've got the goods there, we're gonna dismiss that case. Or we may develop a record here where we say, you know what, we think we've got another case. We wanna add a claim. And that happens all the time. And we do think, given the breadth of, of this case and, and what it deals with, that the more prudent decision would be, let's have some discovery, let's let defendants develop their record and they can file a motion for summary judgment on any or all of these claims. Yes, sir. Think about intentional infliction claims, though. It seems like that at least the experience of the plaintiff, think about a case like Headland or any of the cases we've had, at least the experience that they had uh, would be something that would be easy to describe because you have the plaintiff as your client and you wouldn't really need to know anything through a discovery. But that would, I think that would be relevant if the experience of the plaintiff is relevant for the, for the court to hear what that is through his sworn testimony or through an affidavit or however we would resist a summary judgment motion. I think the record would reflect a significant amount of torment that Mr. Nahas went through and continues to go through as a result of, of, of what happened to him as, as the facts were pled in our petition. In the chapter 21 claim to me? Your Honor, that, that also goes back to um, the, the defamation claim and the wrongful termination claim. But uh, the termination letter is signed by John Norse. Mr. Norse explicitly admitted to Mr. Nahas and then subsequently to Supervisor McCoy that the board made the decision to terminate Mr. Nahas, not John Norse. For the board to have done that, they would have had to have met. For the board to have met, they would have needed to publish notice. Now, they could have met in closed session to discuss this, but Mr. Nahas was never invited to that. So, so the fact that the board made this decision without a public notice um, is, is contrary to Chapter 21. It's not that they had to meet if they wanted to terminate his employment, but they actually did meet. And because they did meet, they needed to give notice first. And they would have had to have met. Typically, maybe John Norris or the county administrator might make this decision. Do have met to terminate an Atwell employee? That's the only way the board to act, for the board to act is to meet. Um, typically, the board wouldn't make this decision. Typically, John Norris would. Right. What I'm saying is, is your claim is that he could have been fired by Norris without any board action. But here, in fact, the board did meet, and because they met, they had to give notice and your claim is for equitable relief or damages? Relief. I do think the chapter 22 and 21 violations go to some of our other claims. And I, I, wanna, I do want to make clear, I don't think I briefed this very well, but the heading of our petition is libel per se. We have pled all of the elements of a traditional libel claim. So even if the court would agree that a document by the fact that it's subject to a FOIA request to get some sort of heightened protection such that it can't give rise to libel per se. The result shouldn't be a dismissal of the case, but rather on remand, if when we proceed to trial, Mr. Nahas has to plead the traditional elements of a libel per quad and not be entitled to the libel per se instruction. But, but getting back to... You've argued uh, in your brief that uh, the qualified immunity statute is unconstitutional. Explain your, your argument. Yes. Uh, so... This court, in, in I believe it was Baldwin, uh, rejected the, the Harlow qualified immunity that we see in, in Section 1983 federal constitutional claims. As a result of that, our legislature enacted this new 670.4a, and I believe during the debate even explicitly acknowledged that they're trying to put Baldwin back in the bottle. And this court said... Before you elaborate on that, did the district court even rule on this issue? I don't, I don't think the district court ruled on the constitutionality issue. Um, Dermot's question. The, the Iowa, the court, this court has held that the Iowa Constitution does not recognize qualified immunity based on the clearly established doctrine. And so the legislature could not do what it did here, which is limit the liability of government officers who commit constitutional torts. They couldn't use the Municipal Tort Claims Act or the State Tort Claims Act 
to do that, which is exactly what they've done. Now, admittedly, our claims are all statutory and common law based, but the, the entire purpose of this new law is, was, was to overturn Baldwin, which the legislature simply can't do. It's, it's, it's going against this court's interpretation of our Constitution. And there's really no way to save 670.4. Did we apply it to common law claims and statutory claims? Baldwin only dealt with constitutional claims. Case, are there any constitutional claims that we need to worry about? Not. Uh, it's, it, it, I think on its face, though, because it applies to everything, that it, the law can't be saved, especially when we know from the debate, the public debate on this law, that the purpose of this statute was to overturn Baldwin. I think, frankly, it was rushed, and the collateral damage of it being rushed is that it's now being applied to negligence claims, car accident claims, uh, any claim against a municipality. Um, under 670, and I, I don't think that was the legislature's intent, and I don't know that the law can be saved um, to say, okay, we're only going to uphold it as it applies to common law and negligence claims, which really, in the, in the context of qualified immunity, doesn't make a lot of sense anyway, because by their nature, a common law claim and a statutory claim are clearly established. Um, so, Just one count, there's seven of them. We don't need to even articulate which one. What if, let's just hypothetically say, what if the court found that on one count, pick your count, no, don't pick your count, any count, um, that the height and pleading applies? And let's say as a court we decide and they didn't meet it. What is the remedy? What, what, what does this court need to do? I know you don't want to go there, but if we say height and pleading applied and you didn't meet it. If we didn't meet it, then it would... Um I don't know that the heightened pleading requirement requires a dismissal with prejudice. The law says failure to state a plausible claim or to plead that the rights were clearly established shall result in dismissal, dismissal with prejudice. So it still would go back to a plausibility. Did we plausibly state a claim? And, and I know we haven't, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole on this, but okay. <laughs> Plausibility, isn't that kind of why the statute was probably written? I mean, if you're saying there's still another loophole, how could the statute ever kick in? Because with a 35 page, 220 plus paragraph, I, I bet you you're going to have a darn good argument for plausible. Sure. And that, and that goes back to trying to apply qualified immunity to common law and statutory claims. They're all clearly established. They're all plausible by the fact that we, this court has recognized them for decades or our statute. <laughs> I'm saying it hasn't been satisfied. So imagine that you, hadn't, you haven't been able to show the court that, that a claim has been established. Um, what do we do with that? We haven't been able to, to show that it's been clearly established. Um, I suppose it would, it would have to result in dismissal based on whatever clearly established means, which I would also note is not defined anywhere in this, in this law. Uh, we, have a whole, we have a whole definition section in 670. And we don't define clearly established. We don't define state with particularity. We don't define plausibility. All we can do is surmise that it means whatever 1983 means. And, I, and Your Honor, I respect that question. I would say that our first petition, second petition, and third petition all meet the vague pleading standards that this new law sets forth to the extent that it does apply. I, I do see my time is up. Thank you for your, your time today. Get there, I'm going to ask you the same question. Thank you, Your Honor. And pleading apply, applies. Let's, and we're only talking about one count. We don't need to talk about everything. And assume this court determines that it has not met the criteria. What do we do with that one count? I would submit, Your Honor, that that's where the legislature has selected the remedy uh, for courts, the dismissal with prejudice. If this court recalls the state's amicus brief in the Alvarez case from last month, the issue in that case was the state's concern of whether or not we had a tripwire here and didn't allow plaintiffs the normal opportunity to file an amended petition. Here, they did so the first time, they did it again a second time, and then stood on that second pleading to be sufficient with the statute. If they had hurried up and filed their own motion to dismiss, their one freebie? It would, Your Honor. I think then the concerns the state raised uh, would necessarily be in effect. Um, 
I don't know if we would um, admit to those differences if that was the case here, but it's not. They chose to stand on the petition that they drafted the second time and submitted it for what we believe is a required substantive 670 review. And at that time, should the court find it to be deficient to the statute, the remedy prescribed by the legislature in that instance would be dismissal with prejudice as opposed to allowing the plaintiffs additional time to recast the petition to again attempt uh, to conform with the statute. A bit about how we apply the statutory immunity and the pleading requirement to common law claims. And I've thought about this a lot. It seems to make a little bit of sense in the constitutional context to apply the Harlow standard and you know Fourth Amendment stuff. Was it clearly established? I'm struggling what that looks like when you apply it to a common law claim. So like take defamation, for example. The tort is clearly established, I mean, by centuries of law, but are we going to do kind of what the federal system does where the particular kind of defamation, the particular kind of statement has to be recognized in some sort of prior case? Is that how you're interpreting it? How to, how to give us some guidance on that? I think that the legislature explicitly chose the language to mirror Harlow. And if you look at Harlow's progeny, specifically the Anderson versus Creighton case, the U.S. Supreme Court goes into great length about how you define the right that's at issue. And the court in that case said, you can't look at a constitutional right such as the right to be free of unlawful search and seizure. Obviously, that's clearly established. If that's the right at issue, there is no qualified immunity. That rule is swallowed. And so I think here you can't look at the actual tort itself. You can't look at defamation. It's claims, right? Yes. So let's say you have a car crash case involving a municipal employee. What do you plead to establish it was clearly established law? Like, you know, it, there's never been a crash at this intersection. There's never been a crash involving this kind of truck. I mean, I the tort's the tort, right? The tort the tort. And I don't think you would have to get so nuanced as that. I don't think that is what the U.S. Supreme Court even requires in the qualified immunity. I mean, there are cases where the court has made a legal distinction between a defendant being bitten by a dog um, and it made a difference on whether the defendant was kneeling on the curb or laying on the curb. And they said, well, the law is not clearly established that if you're attacked by a dog when you're laying down, so then you get immunity. I mean, they have drawn these distinctions. So how do we do that? To the, to the intentionality of and the good faith of the officer's issues. I think in the claim of like a negligence, there is clearly established law for a whole range of, of negligent actions that could lead um, to a car crash, including all traffic laws and whatnot. But I think if you apply it to this case, and I think that Mr. Duff admitted to that to a certain extent when it comes to the wrongful termination tort, that he would have to set forth the case, the statute, the administrative rule that established the public policy that simply uttering the words established are not enough? They're not enough when it comes to the plausibility and the particularity requirements. There's both the factual and legal. And the, the wrongful termination is where we think it legally is insufficient. If you look at like the Chapter 21 claim, there's where we believe it factually implausible. When did this meeting take place? Where did this meeting take place? Who was at the meeting? We have worked back from what the elements are of the tort and then pled legal conclusions disguised as facts. The same is true when it comes to the intentional infliction of emotional distress. You have legal conclusions that appear to be facts. I would also submit that same for the extortion. And I, I see that my time is up. I do want to make one thing clear, if I may, Chief. Thank you. It is absolutely disputed whether or not Mr. Nahas was given the required notice. And in fact, the petition being so lengthy is actually inconsistent on this point. They claim in some paragraphs that he wasn't provided the notice. However, it is also the basis for the extortion claim that Polk County gave Mr. Nahas the opportunity to resign in lieu of termination or he could choose termination whereby the reasons and rationale for his termination would be disclosable upon public records request.
reasons, we would respectfully request that the decision of the district court be reversed. Of Nahas versus Polk County et al. is hereby submitted, and the court will adjourn for the morning. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.